Welcome, welcome back to Bleeding Blue, a show about the history of the New York football giants. It is draft week, one of the best weeks of the year. My name is Justin Pennock. I am alongside my co-host, as always, with this show, Nikki Snacks. Hi, Snacks. Hi. Did you guys miss me last week? Very much so. Very much so. You're coming from a new place. I am. This is the first Bleeding Blue episode in the new apartment. Hopefully it's the last. No offense. All right. Well, I know what you mean. I agree. Because I miss seeing your face. I miss seeing you drink Pinot. And I miss yeah. you spitting on my face whenever you get upset. Uh-huh. I do all those things. Um, that's fine, though. That's just this, this is my nature. Uh, you know, Pinot consumption has gone down a lot, which sucks. But, you know, I'll go bounce back. Um but yeah, yeah, everything is good. The place is nice. There's no rats yet. So, yeah, can't complain. Looking at a big rodent right now. Um, today, oh. what we're doing is we are drafting, and we're having another draft-themed episode. We're having a draft-themed episode, but it's also a draft of the biggest Giants draft bus in franchise history. That's what we're doing today. Um, I broke my own golden rule of announcing that we were going to have an interview before the interview was recorded. License plate guys feeling under the weather. So um, that's on me because I tell people all the time, don't do that. Don't announce that you're going to have somebody on before it's recorded. I did that and I'm an idiot. So what you're, yeah, well, you just took the words out of my mouth. So you're telling our audience that you're a fucking idiot. So yes. yeah, not just an idiot, a fucking yeah. idiot. So speaking right. of idiot and idiot takes, um, you get maybe once or twice a year you get on this show to to really do this. Yes. Snacks, the draft is this Thursday. Correct. Also Friday, Saturday too. You know, that's really fun. But well, most definitely. people are going to be watching that Thursday and night one. Giants have two top 10 picks. Yes. As of now. As of now. Who would you like the Giants to draft on Thursday? Okay, well, I'm going to preface by saying I really hope they trade back from seven and get a 2023 first next year. But since that's not really the name of this this game, I will tell you. I have a multi, multiple different combos that I would like to see, and it starts with Kayvon Thibodeau at five. That's the guy I want most. I know, I know we need a right tackle more than, you know, Flint, Michigan needs clean water. But mm. uh, Tough if you're from Flint. Yeah, sorry, guys. Tough. Um, sorry. Yeah, that was really rude. I, I kind of feel bad. Yeah, um, it's, it's too soon. Too soon. It's been like a fucking decade. Too soon. Uh, well, listen, I donated. I could show receipts. But anyway, I I think this team is obviously starved of offensive line talent, but just is equally as starved as a dominant game changing pass rusher that I think this defense so desperately needs. And that's why Thibodeau is my favorite to go at five, and then. Um, now, if Neil and Icky are off the board, I know yours and Bobby's that you guys talk about, Cross being there at seven, it's not the preferred choice. And I can understand. I watched the film breakdown. I, I listen to you guys talk. But I'm on the side of I don't think I'd be too mad. Uh, would I be elated? No, I wouldn't because Icky and Neil are preferred choices. And listen, if they take Neil or Icky at five and don't land Tibbet on, just as much okay with that because those two guys are going to be really good Really good football players on the offensive line for years to come, bookend with Andrew Thomas. And I would be ecstatic about that because we need an offensive line desperately. However, I just think Thibodeau is that kind of game-changing guy that we need. And uh, if Icky and Neil are gone at, at seven, I want them to take sauce. Double up on defense, I know, I know. But I think those two guys are can't-miss players. And this team needs – can't miss players. <laughs> like yeah, they, I mean, they just need good football players. They man. need good football players, and those two guys <laughs> are good football players. And you know, bottom line, at the end of the day, that's what they need. My preference would be Thibodeau and then Sauce if one of those offensive tackles aren't on the board. But again, there's just so many different directions that we can go, and I would not be mad at all. I mean, in fact, I would be beyond joyed with Icky or, or Neil at five. So... Uh, that's my little spiel. I know it was a lot of word vomit, but I think everybody's probably in the same boat with with those four prospects get, wanting to get at least two of them. Yeah, yeah, I, I think uh, absolutely. Um, you know, and I think there's a good chance that 
at least one of those four is a giant. Right. I would I would I would bet a hundred thousand dollars if I had it on me, one of them will absolutely be a New York Giant. Which one? I don't know. But one of them definitely will. And you see this Trayvon Walker bullshit going number one? I love it. I mean, I love it too. I'm but all for insane. it. Are the Jaguars really about the Jaguar this? You should bet a hundred thousand dollars. You gonna lend me a hundred thousand dollars? No. Why not? No, you just said that if, well, I said, you said if you had a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, I don't have a hundred thousand dollars. I you have a hundred dollars. You could find it. Well, I can't sell blood because I had blood cancer. Nobody wants my blood. It's true. Uh, that is definitely true. Well, hopefully whoever we select Thursday night does not fall into the category of the episode mm. that we're having today, which is. They will. They will. They will. hundred percent will. We are drafting two busts. Sorry. Go ahead. Snacks, uh, we, we thought of this, and then immediately as we hung up the phone, we thought of this episode title since, you know, the LPG interview didn't work out. I'm like, this probably isn't the best um, theme of episode to do the week of the draft. No, <laughs> we're talking about miserable players. <laughs> he, well, well, you're miserable, number one. Correct. And then number two, I'm thinking, well, let's get the bad juju out. Wow. Let's put oh. it out there. Yep. Let's just, this is what went wrong. We can laugh, get together, have a few laughs. We can do that now, and we're going to get all of it out to the, like, get all the bad energy out there. So then Thursday, these two guys are going to be studs. We are doing our part to erase all the demons that have plagued the New York Giants for uh, quite some time now. So you're welcome, everybody. You should all be saying thank you and being appreciative and writing say, us. Say thank you in the chat. Writing us handwritten letters and signing them with blood, of course, because that's what we do around here. Oh, speaking of um, signing, writing letters with blood, I may write the letter with blood, mm. but if they don't open up training camp this year, I will be writing my first ever letter to John Mayer. Why is it taking you this long? Because I honestly care more about going to training camp than winning football games. I think that I'm That's finding that out. Disgusting. <laughs> that just pissed me off so much. I love training camp. <laughs> I know you do, but that that is oh my god. Why is it that I've been able to sit and watch losing for so many years, but you take training camp for me you take training camp away from me for two years and I'm about to lose my mind. Why I, is I, it that? Because you're a sick fuck. I am, yeah. I would say I would say it's got to be a virtual lock that they open training camp back up. I would hope so, but there's it's there's a chance. Money, it's just more of a money grab. Why not do but, it? But here's the thing. They should have it for free. They shouldn't charge. Oh, no, 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 no. I agree. I'm talking about – I think it is free, isn't it? Well, they. Well, you want to know what? Fuck that. They have sponsors and everything like that. So I don't want to they, – they make money off of it somehow. Correct. Exactly. And they're also charging $8 a water bottle in the oh, middle of, is, in yes, the middle of 100 true. degree heat. The you sandwiches. Know are, yeah. You know people are eating and buying water and Gatorades to stay hydrated. You just know beer. it. They do sell beer there too at 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, it's great. I had a – oh, no. I thought about having a beer at when we went to Massachusetts when we saw the Giants, Patriots – um, yeah, should have scrimmage. I should have. I know. Uh, that was the last time I was ever happy with Joe Judge. It's crazy. Yeah, scream screaming at people. All right. Anyway, rest in peace, Joe. We are drafting the biggest Giants draft bus. The biggest, gig, the, the most gigantic giant bus of all time. Boom. And that's what we're. That's what we're drafting. So we, we did the same thing last week with the Entertainer. Blair Stewart's Talk of Giants versus the World seventy seven to nothing coaster is going to serve. As heads, this this side, and then Blair Store 2022 is going to serve as tails. What do you, what is your call? Heads. Who gets the first pick? Heads. He heads. You always bet tails. You're going to lose. Bam. What I tell you? I have the first pick. Yeah, and you're going to take the guy I was going to. He just sucks. I'm taking Cedric Jones. Yeah, I know you are. It's who I was going to take. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? There's probably more and bigger busts in franchise history. Mm, honestly, is there though? Because Cedric Jones has a seven and a half sack year on his resume. Okay. And so what? He was the fifth overall pick and his best year was seven and a half sacks. And it took him three years to actually register a sack. He fucking sucked. And that's not he, even, the he was part. bad. Yeah, he, he was, was awful. Bad. It wasn't, where did he go to college? He went to uh, Oklahoma. Yes. And he dominated. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, according to according to Stephen Verderosa. So I'm gonna oh, I'm gonna revisit these tweets. We've that never idiot. got it. We've never gotten a chance to talk about 
my interactions, not just, there was multiple interactions that I had with Stephen Verderosa about Cedric Jones. And Stephen Verderosa, if you don't know, is a former Giants scout, was fired under Joe Judge and Dave Gettleman. We've had multiple interactions about him justifying. He was on the staff when the Giants took Cedric Jones, 1996, with the fifth overall pick in that draft, defensive end. Um, and if you don't know, Cedric Jones was legally blind in one eye. And he had to, like, had to line up on the right side of the formation, the defensive formation, right side of the ball, because it was his right eye that was fucked up. So this is what Stephen Verderosa said in response to um, my thoughts on Cedric Jones and how funny it was that the Giants drafted a blind guy. Justin, in response to your tweet about Cedric Jones, all draft picks are a collaborative effort between personnel, medical, and ownership. Cedric had big grades coming from Oklahoma, was very productive his last two seasons with the Giants, signed with the Rams, knee cut his career short. Now, this is the funny part. As far as his vision issue, it turned out to be the best thing for Michael Strahan's career because he slid over to the defensive end spot, the left defensive end spot, for the rest of his career. No team gets all their picks right. Cedric was solid at pick five. You wish he was great. Okay. I mean, just his explanation of the of the eye issue, the blindness, is so dumb. It's absurd. It's like saying Josh Rosen was a good pick for the Cardinals because it led them to Kyler Murray. Ex- exactly right. <laughs> exactly. That's a perfect analogy. Literally. Oh, what an, that guy's so stupid. But honestly, I, I think this was – as easy of a pick, this was going to be the number one overall pick for me. Um, fifth overall in your best season is seven and a half sacks, a highly touted defensive end from from Oklahoma. It's just just pathetic. It he really had a is. sack in a good game, a 2000 NFC Championship game. Fuck him. But it's just so funny. And why I think he's the biggest bust is it's also the funniest bust because they literally drafted a blind guy. <laughs> the Giants drafted somebody who was blind. Uh-huh. Blind. You know who else the Giants drafted a couple years later? Who? Well, who's uh, who's uh, your first pick in the in the first round? Yeah, so in 96, they drafted a blind guy. And in 2000, they drafted a fat slob. Mm. And that's Ron Dane. Mm. Um, Ron Dane was the 1999 Heisman Trophy winner from Wisconsin. Yes. He was drafted 11th. And I don't know if his, the position is going to come up later on in this show, but I think we all know how drafting running backs early turns out. Well, that was normal. That it was, was part of the game. Normal in 2000. You're right. You're right. That was yes. part. That was very much part of the game. Taking well, running backs early. So I'm not. Uh, that's not why you fair. fault them fair. for doing Correct. that. But Ron Dane was so good in college. He literally won the Heisman Trophy at Wisconsin. Like he was that damn good. He was terrible with the Giants. Terrible. He was a big man. And on fourth and ones, they were giving the ball to Tiki Barber. And that's another thing. You're drafting Ron Dane at 11 when you already have Tiki Barber. Now, granted, Tiki didn't really break out like he did until later. And here I am mentioning Tiki Barber's name and almost kind of, wow. sticking, up for, and almost kind of sticking up for him. Oh. Anyway, just Ron Dane was never productive. He, he didn't do anything that moved the needle, didn't see a second contract. He was just overall a miserable, miserable football player for the Giants, drafted way too high, and for the little production he gave us, he is a gigantic, literally, and fig- – well, no, just literally. Literally and figuratively. Yeah, but but these are both literally because he's a gigantic person and he's literally a gigantic bust. So, yes. Ron Dane, two literallys, my number one pick. All right. Four years, 16 touchdowns. Two 100-yard games as a Giant. His longest carry was 61 yards against the Packers in 2001. What also happened in that game, Snacks? What year was it? 2001? Mm-hmm. That was Michael Strahan's. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was yeah. Michael Strahan's uh, record-breaking sack against Brett Favre, who people think fell down, but he didn't. Michael was going to sack him anyway, so it doesn't matter. It's so, that, I mean, little, little do people know, same game where Ron Dane had his longest carry as a New York football Giant. I was at do that re- game. Do you were you at that game? I was at that game. Yes. Wow. Yes, and this is uh, actually this is this is where I fell even more in love with Tiki Barber back in the day when I was stupid and naive. 
they used to have the practice bubble next to the stadium where they used oh. to, you know, they used to practice. That was their practice facility. They had a big bubble. And uh, my, the people I went with, um, they had access after the game to the bubble, like where players come in and shit like that. And uh, I loved Tiki at the time. And Tiki was in a place where uh, we were not allowed. Like we didn't have tickets for that spot. So somebody that was there like snuck me under and I got to meet Tiki and he signed my jersey. I had it framed until uh, till his comments and then I burned his jersey. So. Did you really burn it? Yes, I burned it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I have a picture of it. Oh, it was a long time ago. I, I have a signed mini Tiki Barber helmet in Throw my it out. room. Should I give it to you for your birthday one year? Well, if you want to lose a friend. Do you remember why he... We we talked about this on um, If These Walls Could Talk. Ah. About his 2003 season. Do you remember what happened? No. Refresh he me. just didn't play. Yeah, because he sucked. He missed the entire season. He was a fifth string running back who was basically a healthy scratch every single week because the Giants wanted to trade him. Ron Dane didn't want to be traded. The Giants didn't want to cut him. So he basically pulled a Ben Simmons and just found a way to and finessed a way to not play an entire season in 2003. Uh, it's just unbelievable. And that just further makes the narrative of him being my number one bust even better. Plus, yeah. Ben Simmons is an epic loser, too, by the way. Fuck the Nets. Get out of here. Fuck them. Get out of here. Fuck the Nets fans, too. Anyway, Whoa. go ahead. Who's your second round pick? Now, you definitely don't have him on your board. Okay, so this is going to be interesting. I'm going to go with Joe Don Looney. No, I didn't have him on my board. Who was drafted 12th overall in 1964 by the New York Football Giants. He was kicked out of school. First of all, he was kicked out of a few different schools. But he was kicked out of school for punching an assistant coach while he was in college. Love that. And didn't finish whatever, you know, whether it probably his senior season, didn't finish his season. Really, really talented. The Giants drafted him anyway. The Giants traded him to the Baltimore Colts 28 days into the whatever season. I don't even think he played a game. He didn't even play a game for the Giants. But 28 days into whatever whatever program, they traded him to the Baltimore Colts and to Don Shula. That's unbelievable. First of all, what a story. He punched an assistant coach. He's one of my favorite players in NFL history. Yeah, he's 100% up there for me now, too. I love that fire. I love that. Love it. You steroids. And this is when steroids started to make their way into the NFL. I think the Chargers were one of the first teams. Now, it wasn't illegal because it just like wasn't a thing. So the early 60s, and that's when Joe Don Looney was kind of brought into the league. So he did steroids in kind of college and in the NFL. And I think you could tell. Um, but it wasn't really an issue whether it was legal or not because nobody had a problem with whoever taking it because it was just kind of brand new. Right. Um, longtime NFL Films president Steve Sable, which I love the Sables, by the way, yes, called him the most uncoachable player <laughs> in NFL history. And Michael McCambridge, author of America's Game, which I have this book. No, it's in Manhattan. I have it, though. It's in Manhattan. I want to read that book one day. It was a plan to actually read it on this show. Hmm. Michael McCambridge, author of America's Game, quoted, Looney was in this group of players who were asking, why should I jump? Why do I need to jump now? What is me jumping going to do for the cause? Why do I have to jump during practice when I can jump during the game? So it was, um, he broke uh, team rules. It was, he had a problem with um, like the dress policy and the dress code. In college, he would hate that the athletes would have to eat separate from the rest of the students. Like he literally, this guy literally had a problem with every single thing, every single thing this guy had a problem with. And the giants took him 12th overall in the first round. I mean, how do you, how do you whiff like that? <laughs> like, like, like With all the red flags that are coming into it already, how do you whiff like that? Do you think like, in the sixties you're, you're saying because it's the 1960s, this guy punched an assistant coach. This guy is fire. I mean, if that happened today, I'd be banging on the table to draft him. If I saw that, like if George I read, Pickens. if I if I read, yeah, well then draft him, draft him. 
I'm not kidding. George Pickens uh, spit in a like an opposing the opposing sideline, somebody on the opposing sideline's face in like 2020 or 2019. Good God, that's you know wide what? receiver out of Georgia. So you're a fan of George Pickens now. I feel like I want to trade back into the first round for him. You have an entire list of people that you would spit on if you ever saw them in person. So yes, I do, and I maybe one day I will disclose some of those people on the list, even though I'm sure a lot of people can figure that out. But the list is back home in Bergen County, which I am not at. Um, yeah, it's it's a list. It's a good list. Uh, do you know? You want to take a guess who number one is? It's not Tiki. Oh, it's 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 a it's a LeBron Blames. It is LeBron Blames. He is number yeah. one. Tiki's number two. Speaking of number two, let's get to my second round pick. Yes. I am going to go 1992, a year before I was born. And I'm going to take Derek Brown, the tight end at a Notre Dame. And this is why, because he was 14th overall pick, right? So if you're drafting a tight end 14th overall, you'd probably expect some pretty good, you know, I, I would assume some pretty good uh, production, right? You would hope. You would hope. Yeah, you'd hope. Well, in 45 games, he only started seven of them. His Giants career lasted from 92 to 94. He made 11 catches for 87 yards and did not score once. That's a first-round tight end, Justin. He had 11 catches. That's what I said. For 87 yards. That's what I said, too. He made a total of $3 million from the Giants. (laughs) That is $272,727.27 per catch. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Like, really? Really? He wasn't even that good in college or production wise when you look at his numbers. Well, he, here's the thing. Um, no, please tell me. How are you going to spin this? The guy's a fucking bust. He caught 22 receptions, 325 yards for his senior year. And you have to think, and you have to remember the uh, tight end. I, know, I knew you were going to say this. Go ahead. The tight end position kind of back then is not the tight end position now where you're looking at all this production and you're throwing the ball. And he, he helped win. No, he helped Notre Dame win a national championship in 1988. His first two touches at Notre Dame in the 1988 season, they both went for touchdowns. And also you're trying to replicate the magic that you found with Mark Bavaro, who was also a tight end from Notre Dame. Okay. Yeah. That's all well and good, but I'm sorry. I don't give a shit how much the game was different. My first round pick a top 15 pick. 11 catches in three years? Are you kidding me? It's not good. I, it, it's not good? It's an abomination. <laughs> Fuck if you that. Google, no, Derek, no, no, I'm not going to Google. Derek if Brown you Google sucked. Derek Brown, the first thing that comes up is not the football player, but an American saxophonist from Chicago, Illinois. Well, I, wish he, I wish he was drafted by the Giants and not this Derek Brown. And Derek Brown... The football player is currently a senior energy advisor at Green Crown Energy and Water, and he also is a director of operations at Jersey Mike's, which I fucking love Jersey Mike's. That is pretty cool. But you're just that – see, to me, those two companies hired hired a loser. So I don't I don't get it, but whatever. That That's just me, and he's my second – Second round pick, Derek Brown, tight end, Notre Dame, drafted 14th in 1992, 11 catches, 87 yards in his Giants tenure. Loser. Loser. All right, so the top one, two, three, four guys on my big board are taken. Wow. So Derek Brown was on your board? Yes, he was actually first. Really? Yeah, I just wanted to talk about Cedric Jones. <laughs> yeah, so I got some I got some great value in the second round right there. You did. You got some very good value. He was first on my big board, um, hoping he would fall a little bit more. But the next guy on my big board, we are in the third round, first pick, Dave Brown. Yeah. This quarterback is from Duke. He was the first round pick in the 1992 Ugh. supplemental draft. Ugh. The thing about... Dave Brown is, yeah, yeah, he was bad. Yeah, he threw more interceptions than touchdowns. But this would cost them the top first-round pick in in next year's draft, 1993. Adding insult to injury. But here's the thing. Now, the Giants did a great job, and that was, I think, George George Young's final draft in 93. That was a great fucking draft. And, you know, when we were drafting the draft classes last week with – um. Christiana Tana, that was one of the first ones because it was Michael Strahan and it was Jesse Armstead. Not so bad. let's let's look in the I actually want to look right now. Let's look at the 1993 draft. Look in the first round. It was Jerome Bettis was taken 10th. 
He was a Hall of Famer. Willie Rofe was taken eighth for the Hall Saints. He was a tackle. Um, he was a Hall of Famer. Um, Irv Smith was taken as a tight end. I feel like that's a recognizable name. Um, so, I mean, the the knowing the Giants had such a fantastic draft in 93 when they did not have a first-round pick, imagine how much better it could have been if with the first round pick. with with the first round pick so that that's the one where it's a tough pill to swallow where you look at the 93 draft class it is one of the best giants draft classes of all time but it's taken it's taken away a first round pick because you picked dave brown in the supplemental draft the year before yeah and that we know how that worked out uh it's also pretty funny that because in 2005 we didn't have a first round pick either and that was one hell of a draft too yeah, and that's a common theme of the Giants just overall is that their second-round draft picks are just like much better than their right. first-round draft picks. So I have an idea. Just trade everything. Never pick in the first round again. Never. Never again. No. No. That Dave Brown, you know, it, it's, an, it's an absolute sin how bad he was. And I thought maybe the New York Giants had learned their lesson on taking quarterbacks from Duke, but they clearly didn't because they drafted another loser later, a couple decades later. Um but yeah, no, Dave Brown. How do you? He was on my list. He was he was number four for me. But yeah, he was complete and utter disgrace to the game of football. There haven't been actually, if you look at the history of the Giants, you know, there haven't been a ton, a lot of starting quarterbacks that we've had. You know, compared to some teams where there's been longevity of of Sims, who even though Sims missed games due to injury, he was always the starter. Right. So from 79 to 93, he was basically the starter, right? Eli Manning for all those years. Um, Dave Brown found a way to play 55 games and he was That's 22. And, he was 22 and 30 in those 55 games. And you can say that Dave Brown is the worst like starting quarterback in Giants franchise history. There, there may have been worse quarterbacks to start a game. Right. But as but, a long-term starter, he is yeah. the worst. Correct. And that's quite an accomplishment i you when you just said his record 22 and 30 that kind of taken me aback i would have assumed a lot worse but 40 touchdowns 49 interceptions oh god that's not that's great so bad that's so bad you know who else was really bad who else eric flowers mm. i his the name eric flowers will haunt me for arguably my whole life. He, I believe, I don't have it in front of me. I'm sorry. I believe that was the 2015 draft. It's 2015. Yeah. 2015 draft, the Giants in absolute desperate, desperate need of offensive line help because, you know, how well they've, they've built that thing up. They take out of the U, Eric Flowers. And this man was arguably – Justin, you, you could say he's arguably the worst offensive lineman in Giants history. That was drafted. Just, for, the ex, for the expectation – Yeah, I was just going to say, for fa- factoring in all of the, you know, the logistics, I guess you could say. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a specialty or a um, – you know, I'm not a genius when it comes to bad Giants offensive linemen. But that will be a good question to pose for people. Is Eric Flowers the worst offensive lineman in Giants franchise history knowing where where and when he was drafted? Correct. And he, I believe he was drafted ninth. Yes, he was drafted ninth. 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 Yeah, this is ninth. a top 10 pick. <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. He was drafted ninth and he was – I don't know if he had one good game ever in his tenure with the Giants. What's and- wild is that his rookie year wasn't – Bad to the point where you feel like he can't become Something. an okay player. Right. He played that entire year similar to Andrew Thomas's 2020. Yeah. Played with an ankle injury. And mm-hmm. I remember thinking after that 2015 season, this dude's tough. He had to move to left tackle because the plan wasn't for him to move to left tackle right away. The plan was for Will Beatty to play left tackle. He gets hurt and he's done. So Flowers goes from right tackle to left tackle, gets hurt. And is tough, you know, I guess he isn't great and isn't good, but I don't remember, I don't remember being like really mad at Eric Flowers from his rookie year thinking that he can't become an okay player. But then everything after that is just, I I was just going to say, it was was probably like October of 2016 where I'm like, okay, this guy's 
atrocious. And the thing is, is that when you're not willing to put in the work, when you're lazy well, and you don't care, um, and you're out here shoving reporters and everything like that, yep, uh, that we was, stand, we stand Jordan Ron on. That was um, my next, that was my next point. He was <laughs> a lazy, entitled piece of shit. Yeah. And it's funny. I'll never forget. He pushes Ron, uh, Jordan and ESPN does that, the, you know, all NFL beat writers, they do the draft, like the beat writer takes the, you know, the player for the team that they cover. And Jordan took Eric Flowers at ninth that year. I, I remember it distinctly. And sure enough, Eric goes out and tries to kick the shit out of him. He was just, <laughs> he, he was a nasty, he was a nasty person, a shitty attitude and somebody that I never want. I don't want to hear his name again. And it, people are gonna be like, oh, well, you know, he transitioned to guard in, in Washington and actually found some success. I don't give a fuck. He was an atrocity here. How many times he tried to get Eli killed? I think he had something out against Eli. That's personal, but. Eric Flowers. No bueno. And nope. I don't think it's just recency bias of saying Correct. that he's one of the biggest busts in franchise history. Correct. And um, obviously you could, you know, people could argue that, but no, it's not recency bias. He, for where he was drafted, it's, he was an abomination. I've used abomination a lot today. Well, it's, it's because it's what these guys are. That's a good point. Fuck him. All right. Where I am going to go next. We have uh, two picks left, right? You, you and I? You have one. I have one. Yes. All right. So we are in the fourth round. We are having eight total picks. I didn't, I didn't actually say that. Two picks left. I am going to go. Don't do it. Tyrone Wheatley. Mm, good one. Selected out of Michigan with the 17th overall pick in the 1995 draft, Tyrone Wheatley was a running back. It was a curious pick because Rodney Hampton was still in his prime. Now, Rodney Hampton only played for two years after the 95 season, but his 94-95 season, that stretch was really, really good for him. So the Giants taking Tyrone Wheatley was curious. He averaged 3.6 yards per rush, 27.8 rushing yards per game, never rushed for more than 600 yards in any of his four seasons with Big Blue. Of course, he goes on to the Raiders, and I actually think that he has like kind of a somewhat respectable, decent one or two seasons. What hurts most, though, is that Ty Law and Derek Brooks were both oh. drafted a few oh. picks after Wheatley, and Curtis Martin was drafted in the third round, and those are all Hall of Fame players. So Tyrone oh. Wheatley is uh, one of my picks as one of the biggest Giants draft busts of all time. Yeah, and it's such a shame because what a great name, Tyrone Wheatley. Like, that's a name you root for. It's a great name. It's a great name, but he was, he was, he was terrible. And, you know, the Rodney Hampton angle to that, too, is kind of – you know, it's kind of like me saying with uh, the whole Tiki thing with, with Ron Dane. Tiki and Ron Dane, right? Exactly. Like, why are you adding to your riches in the backfield when you just don't need to? And there's other positions. I'm I'm throwing out the. Uh, I'm not saying like running back positional value. No, the game back then was different, so I, I get that. But when you already have a talented starter back there, there is just no need to press your luck and make a pick that egregious, that high at a position that you're already set on. Yeah. So like it's just it's very frustrating um, that that these guys turn out like that. But Tyron Wheatley, he was pathetic, and my nose is dripping. Who's your final pick? Yeah, all right. I've so, been I've been enjoying seeing the transformation of you this episode go from sounding like shit to sounding more shitty. Yep, yep. It just keeps getting worse and worse. But I I I play. This is my Michael Jordan flu game. Oh yeah. Um. All right, so this is a toss-up, and I'm I'm still on on edge. I want I want to pick Eli Apple so bad for a multitude of reasons. One being his mother. Two, <laughs> <laughs> I hate her. Two, maybe it is a little bit recency bias, especially with this playoffs and him getting fucking burnt in the Super Bowl. But I also want to highlight the failure of that draft with Jerry Reese. I'm not going to pick. I'm not going to pick. It was so known by everybody in the world that Jerry Reese wanted Leonard Floyd or Jack Conklin. One of those were going to be the picks. So what do the bears and Titans do? Jump. They them. jump. They jump. They jump. And they settle on Eli Apple, who probably they, they probably were never going to even think about Eli Apple. They panicked and he was awful. He was awful. I, I won't, I'm not going to, I'm not going to draft him right here. Because, I don't know, there was probably a few games where he was all right. But it's just another world-class bust. However, I 
I am going to go to the year 94. Now, I went to 92 before with Derek Brown, but I am going to go with Thomas Lewis. A little shocker, right? Yeah. Yeah. So Thomas Lewis was drafted by the New York Giants in 19. Oh, God, I'm so sorry. I got, I'm sorry. Hold on. I got Ajita. Oh, big time Ajita. Oh, God. Jesus Christ. Okay. He was drafted in, I believe it was pick 24 in 1994. Yep. Wide receiver. But here's my thing. He played four years with the Giants and he was done. Played 34 games, started 15. Okay. So you're a wide receiver. Yeah. It's a running league what, back then, whatever the case. But you're a wide receiver drafted in the first round and your total production for four years of the tenure you're in with the team that drafted you is 74 catches, 1,032 yards, and five touchdowns. And a uh, 47.7 catch rate, which is... Disgusting. <laughs> really, really bad. <laughs> Disgusting. Now, I'll give him some credit to uh, 1996. He had 53 catches, 694 yards, and four touchdowns. So think about that. One of the four years he was there, he got almost literally all of his production. What's up with these draft busts having really good seasons in their, like, their third year, their third, fourth year? <laughs> uh, maybe that was their contract year. Yeah, you, yeah, you may be. I don't, I don't know. I have no idea. I, know it's I would guess it's so four years. Like, yeah, I would that's my that. guess. But like that. Cedric Jones, the same thing. Why is it? Ta- why does it take these guys three, four years to find it, and then and then they kind of find it, and then they just like, all right, cool, I'm good. I'm gonna lose. I it. did it once. Yeah. Yeah. Peace. They can get complacent. But it's just like that. That is that is just such uh, having literally almost all of your production in one season out of four is embarrassing absolutely embarrassing so that's why uh, thomas lewis drafted 1994 at 24 overall wide receiver is my final bust for the biggest for the most gigantic bust in giants history boom i love it love it we did it i gotta tell you that okay i went a lot better than i thought it would yeah Got, we, we talked about some guys that, that we normally wouldn't ever. <laughs> um, so that was cool. A couple of honorable mentions, I guess you could throw out there. Um, yeah, I won't do honorable Gerard mentions. Bunch, the guy that you mentioned before. Yes, yeah, that's a bust. He was last on, he was last on my board. And um, the thing that sucks about that is 1991, six picks after Bunch was taken, Brett Favre was taken. Now, you can be like, well, the Giants still had Phil Sims. Phil Sims was 35. Um, so, hey, I, I you know. I, it's kind of like a 2018 thing where they took a running back instead of trying to start planning for their future with Eli declining. Yeah. Um, Phil Sims, the 95 and 90, uh, no, excuse me, the, the, the 91 and 92 seasons, barely played any games. Believe it, like he played in six games back-to-back seasons. And then his last season, he actually had a Pro Bowl season. He finished off kind of solid. But, uh. What's your take on Brett Favre? My take on Brett Favre? Yeah, because you're like a you're like a Peyton Manning hater. I am overrated. I am an Aaron Rodgers hater. I think Me too. like just asshole. Uh, he tries to conduct everything and tries and he tried this past off season to be Mister GM and you know I want things my way and you know what did he do? He sucked in a very important home playoff game yeah. a- against a. 49er team that could not throw outside the hash marks and they yeah. lost that game. So I think Aaron Rodgers, I don't, I think he's an asshole. So what's your take on Brett Favre? That's a really good question. And I have, I was always a Brett Favre fan. Um, you know, he's only got that one ring. Eli has two, but a lot of Eli's game is when you think about it, kind of like Favre's. Eli would just throw it up, give your guy a chance, whatever. Didn't care. Um, Brett Favre was a gunslinger. He would just go out and he was tough as nails. I always appreciate that about Brett Favre. He was tough as nails. Now, towards the end of his career, he was a little bit annoying where he would retire and then he'd come out of retirement and then he would do it again. Like to me, that, that the, the whole dramatic, you know, drama scenes that Brett Favre pulled on was, uh, was quite annoying. And I guess that's where Aaron Rodgers got all, all that from. But <laughs> I, was always a, I was always a fan of Brett. And I will always be grateful for Brett because his last pass as a Green Bay Packer was to Corey Webster's arm. True, so. true. I, th- I thought you would have more of a firm take on like, hey, you think Peyton's overrated. Hey, you think this guy, blah, blah, blah. I always thought that you I, I thought that you would have more of a firm take, but you're, far, you're a Favre fan, huh? I, I always was, yeah. Um, and uh, I guess I guess it starts in 2001, the straight hand game. 
Yeah, well, uh, if the Giants didn't take uh, Gerard Bunch, he could have been a Giant. Well, so He would have looked good in Giant Blue. He would have been loved. He would, like, would definitely would have been loved. He would have been loved, and then he would have been loathed. Yeah. Like, think of him throwing all those fucking interceptions in New York. He's got the most interceptions of all time, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, Eli's up there, too. But, I well, mean, that he, doesn't mean that discredit his great. I mean, you're just playing football games, you know? No, I, I, I listen, I, I know. But Brett Favre, he was, I, I did. I, I liked Brett Favre. I was a Favre fan. I don't know. Maybe because I could never spell his name either. Favre. I have, I had a hard time with that. Favre. So Favre. Stupid. So stupid. Yeah. But that is a, that's, that's a fun little show for you guys. So, you know, making each other miserable before Thursday, hopefully the guys we take in the first round um, aren't on this list when me and Justin do it again in 10 years. So bad juju's out. It's bad out. juju's out. Bad energy's out. Get, we did rid of, Getting rid of the demons that have surrounded us for so long. They're out. All right, so we will not be seeing you next week. No. We will not. Um, we are going to be crushing it with uh, everything that comes after the draft on Talking Giants. So we're going to have a Talking Giants episode coming to you on Monday. Bobby will probably have some draft uh, film breakdowns coming to you guys that we take, um, even the UDFAs too. So we will be not coming to you next week. But then the following week, we're going to have – a book to read. Yes, that's I. I love the our book episodes. I don't, yeah. you know. I think I think they're a lot of fun, and it opens our eyes to a lot of different other things that we don't see um, behind the scenes. So that's going to be a fun one. The Big Fifty by Patricia Trania. Um, that is the book that we're going to be reading, and we're also going to be doing like a Bleeding Blue book club via Twitter Spaces. Yeah. So if you want to buy the book, and you want to be part of that, and you want to read with us. Do, do that. So that's in two weeks. No, don't give them the option if you want to. Just fucking do it. It's going to be a lot of fun. Yes, I agree. Like, don't be, don't, you know, don't, don't miss out on good opportunities, people. Please. Bunch of doink with fucks. All right. So we will see you in two weeks. Enjoy two weeks. the NFL draft. The Giants are going to get better as a football team. That is a guarantee. Keep on bleeding blue and snacks. Fuck Tiki Barber.